Seven myths about altitude that you probably think are true. If you mention you're going high altitude trekking, you may get a lot of advice on how to cope with potential acute mountain sickness and the elevation. But many of the beliefs surrounding how to best acclimatize to the low oxygen environment are factually incorrect. In this video, I'll dispel seven of the most common myths about dealing with altitude. Myth number one, drinking water prevents altitude sickness. Drink water. On the Kilimanjaro trek, you will be reminded constantly about staying well hydrated. It's easy to become dehydrated in the sunny, dry climate on the mountain. Four to five liters a day is the recommendation we give to our clients. Despite the widely accepted view that drinking water is a preventative against acute mountain sickness, research shows otherwise. Drinking water does not prevent or treat altitude sickness. So why do so many people think water is the key to acclimatization? Probably because we hear a good number of anecdotal tales of people feeling better at altitude after drinking water. Not only from clients and mountaineers, but also from guides and porters. And if you ask me, I personally would swear that it helps. In the times I've experienced altitude sickness on Kilimanjaro and other peaks, which has happened about a dozen times in my life, immediately drinking a liter of water definitely seemed to reduce the symptoms within an hour or two. So what could be happening? It could be dehydration, which can be easily confused with symptoms of altitude sickness and drinking water is actually eliminating the symptoms of dehydration. Or it could be mere coincidence that the passage of time was all I needed to adjust. Regardless of the reason why it seems to help, we always encourage clients to hydrate. Just be aware that drinking a lot of water is no guarantee against altitude sickness. Myth number two, caffeine is bad for you on the mountain. It's well known that caffeine is a diuretic. So the theory goes that drinking caffeine causes you to pee, which in turn causes dehydration. And what did we just learn about hydration or lack thereof? This is what the research says. One study showed that caffeine did not appear to increase the amount of urination. Another showed that for caffeine to have a significant diuretic effect, the amount you would need to consume is more than 500 milligrams per day, or the equivalent of more than one liter of brewed coffee. Therefore, it seems that consuming caffeine in normal amounts would not increase the chance of dehydration or altitude sickness. Furthermore, it might even be plausible that caffeine helps acclimatization by increasing the breathing rate and thereby increasing oxygen intake. Just be careful, because you definitely don't want caffeine to impede your ability to sleep. So be reasonable in the amount of caffeine you choose to consume. Myth number three. Being fit is the best way to prevent altitude sickness. It makes sense that fit people would fare better on any athletic endeavor than unfit people. But one of the greatest female players, Martina Navratilova, and former soccer player, Robbie Savage, both failed on their Kilimanjaro journeys due to AMS. This shows fitness is no guarantee against altitude sickness. Do you know the demographic that altitude sickness strikes the most? It's young, fit, athletic males. This is evidence that being fit does not prevent one from getting altitude sickness. It might actually be a contributing factor. What happens is that people who are in shape are able to hike fast, so fast that the body cannot keep up with acclimatization to the altitude. The best way to avoid altitude sickness is to gain elevation at a slow, gradual pace. This allows the body to adapt little by little to the decrease in oxygen. Our guides set an easy pace, which gives your body the best chance at dealing with the thin air environment. Even if you think we're going too slow, it will help you in the long run. Myth number four, if you were okay at high altitude before, you'll be okay the next time. While your past experience at high altitude is significant, it's by no means definitive. There are fundamental factors that affect your ability to acclimatize, such as genetics, general health, fitness, and medical conditions. There are also many situational factors that contribute to the onset of AMS, such as the rate of ascent, hydration level, hiking pace, 
physical exertion, nutrition, and sleep. A prior history of altitude sickness is the strongest indicator for whether one will get altitude sickness again. However, not getting altitude sickness on one trip does not automatically rule out the possibility of getting altitude sickness on a subsequent trip. The message here is don't get complacent. You're not protected simply because you've never had altitude sickness before. Myth number five, you can beat altitude sickness if you're tough. Everyone is susceptible to altitude sickness. In fact, you should expect to experience some symptoms of mild AMS during your climb. These include headache, nausea, shortness of breath, dizziness, and lack of appetite. This is considered normal. These symptoms usually subside by themselves just by staying put for a few hours. However, if symptoms become moderate to severe, it's time to stop climbing. Some people think you can tough it out and keep ascending, but that's a mistake and potentially a deadly one. When I read personal accounts on blogs that describe how people kept climbing despite their serious altitude symptoms, I shake my head. This should not be encouraged or glorified because this is what kills people on Mount Kilimanjaro. It's not tough, it's just plain dumb. Altitude sickness is a physical ailment, not a mental challenge. The best way to treat altitude sickness is immediate descent. It cannot be beaten with a strong mind or positive thinking. If you feel like crap, it's time to go down. Myth number six, you can simulate training at altitude with a mask. There are products on the market that are set to simulate training in a high altitude environment. These masks restrict your breathing, making it more difficult to pull in oxygen. The purported benefit of wearing an altitude training mask is that it improves VO2 max, which is a measure of cardiorespiratory fitness. However, research shows that these masks do not help with acclimatization. The problem is that having your air intake restricted with the barrier isn't the same as breathing thinner air. Masks don't simulate the same type of hypoxia that you would experience on a mountain. Thus, the body does not make any adaptations that would assist with acclimatization. If you want to reap the benefits of high altitude training without actually having to be at high altitude, you can use an altitude tent. An altitude training system allows a climber to pre-acclimatize at home before facing the mountain. Myth number seven, Diamox masks symptoms of altitude sickness. The most popular medication for altitude sickness is acetazolamide otherwise known as Diamox. Some say that Diamox masks altitude sickness but does not treat the underlying cause. This is inaccurate. Diamox induces elimination of a chemical in the body called bicarbonate. When bicarbonate levels fall, your blood becomes more acidic. In turn, you breathe faster, thereby taking in more oxygen. It doesn't mask altitude sickness. It supports the natural process of acclimatization. There you have it. Seven myths about altitude. If you learned anything, please like and subscribe for more videos on climbing Kilimanjaro. Visit us at ultimatekilimanjaro.com, the number one guide service for climbing Kilimanjaro. Until next time, I'll see you on the summit.